lot of denominations in this world. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but I mean, even if you just think about Middletown, Ohio, think about all the different churches, all the different congregations, all the different denominations. And I was looking recently just to confirm this. I thought this was the case, but I wanted to confirm it before I said it publicly. But according to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, Right now, there are nearly 45,000 different denominations. That's really hard to believe, isn't it? Nearly 45,000 different denominations. Now, some of those denominations are huge. I mean, you take, for instance, like the Roman Catholic Church, that's huge. Some of those denominations are not that large. But even if you think, for instance, of the Baptist. A lot of different denominations among the Baptists. How many of you were raised in a Baptist church? Anybody want to raise their hand? Yeah, several here today. You have Southern Baptist, Free Will Baptist, Missionary Baptist, Landmark Baptist, Primitive Baptist, Regular Baptist, United Baptist, Separate Baptist, and I could just go on and on and on. That's not even a fourth of all the Baptist denominations in the world. And so as you look around, it can sometimes be confusing. It can sometimes be disheartening. I feel for those that are looking for a church home, and maybe you're here today because you're looking for a church home. You're looking for a place to raise your family. You're looking for a place of connectivity. You're looking for a place where you can seek God and develop your relationship with God. And you look over the church horizon all these different congregations, all these different denominations, and you say, which one is the right one? It can be hard to decide. But you know, according to the Bible, there is one body of Christ. Many congregations, many denominations, but one body of Christ. And I'd like for them to put a graphic up here for you to see today. And this kind of gives us a picture of what the Bible talks about when it speaks of the body of Christ. And, of course, I have said there's nearly 45 denominations in the world. I can't put all of those up there. But these are some of the major players. And even some of these divide out, like the Baptists. But you have the Roman Catholics, Pentecostals, Anglicans, Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Presbyterians. And what I want you to notice... You have the big circle. That's the body of Christ. That's everyone who follows Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And if you look at these different denominations, and I'm not putting down any of these denominations, but I don't think any of us would say that every single Lutheran, every single person that claims to be Lutheran is a follower of Jesus or every single Catholic, or every every single Methodist. You have some in the Methodist church, hopefully many, maybe most, I don't know, that are in the body of Christ, but just because you're a Methodist doesn't mean you're in the body of Christ. Just because you're Episcopalian doesn't mean you're in the body of Christ. And some of these might be different. Maybe it's 90%, 10%, maybe it's 50-50. I don't know. I'm not God. I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make these judgment calls. But I can tell you this, that not everyone who is in a denomination is also in the body of Christ. Because it's one thing to be in a denomination and attend a service and do whatever they expect for you to do. It's another thing with all of your heart to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in him and to believe in him and follow him. And when you are saved, you are placed in the body of Christ. Now, you can be in both. You can be in the body of Christ, and you can also be an Anglican. You can be both, but you can also be one and not the other. That's what I want to talk about today, the one body of Christ. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 right now, and last week we looked at the first three verses, and for the next several weeks we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 6. Seven acclamations in these three verses. The one body and then the one spirit. You have these seven acclamations with the word one. We're going to give a message to each of these seven acclamations. Beginning today, which is the one body. But we'll read all three verses each Sunday. Look at verse 4. It says, There is one body and one spirit, that would be the Holy Spirit, 
just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. One body. Now, by the way, this is a uniquely Pauline phrase. The Apostle Paul is the only one that uses this language in the New Testament, the language of one body. And he says this like six or seven times in his writings, that there is one body. Now, Jesus, of course, on earth, he had a physical body, and even now he has a glorified body in heaven. But he, he the Son of God, inhabited a physical body, but he also has a spiritual body. So when you think about the body of Christ, you could be talking about the physical or glorified body of Christ, or you could be talking about the spiritual body of Christ. That's you. That's me, those of us who have believed in Jesus. And according to the Bible, there's only one body. Yes, many denominations, yes, many congregations, but one body, and we should foster that unity. We should want that unity. So if I meet someone that's a fellow believer and they are in any of those categories, I don't care which category it is, Pentecostal, Roman Catholic, it doesn't matter. If they have a true faith in Jesus, I will extend to them the right hand of fellowship and say, you are my brother in Christ or you are my sister in Christ. I may not agree with all their doctrines. We may practice things differently. But if they have an experience with Jesus in their life and they're following him, I don't care about their denominational affiliation. We are still one in Jesus Christ. That's what the church of God has taught for all these years, that there is one body. Now, there is diversity in that one body. There's unity, but there's also diversity. I mean, think about your human body. You know, I have arms, I have legs, I have knees, I have ankles, I have elbows, but it's one body. Different parts, different members, but one body. And the same is true in the spiritual body of Christ. There's unity, but there's also diversity. There's differences. Let me talk about a couple of those differences. One is, and by the way, both of these are found in Ephesians. One is there are different gifts in the one body. If you look on down to verses 11 through 13 of chapter 4, Ephesians, it says, speaking of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Now, if you remember, I told you last week, the word unity is only found twice in the New Testament, both in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 3 and again in verse 13. This chapter is all about unity. But in the midst of unity, Paul says that Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, or you might translate that pastors slash teachers, because that's what a pastor does. A pastor teaches the Word of God faithfully and in a way that helps Christians to grow in their faith. And what you notice here, we don't all have the same gifts. Some were apostles, some were prophets, some were evangelists, some were pastors and teachers. You can go to other places in the New Testament like 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or Romans chapter 12 or 1 Peter chapter 4 and you can read more about spiritual gifts. You can make a list of all the different spiritual gifts that are found in the New Testament. And what you'll realize, we don't all have the same gifts. Now, some might want to say that every Christian should have a certain gift. Like some might say, if you're truly saved or you're truly filled with the Spirit, you will speak in tongues. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't say that we all have the same spiritual gifts. Your gift is probably different from my gift. And you don't decide what gift you have. God decides that. Right here it says, and he gave some to be this, and he gave some to be that. You don't decide this. The Lord decides. 
And when we have spirit-gifted leaders in the church and everyone is doing ministry according to their giftedness, there will be unity in the church. If you're serving the Lord and I'm serving the Lord, there will be unity in the church. So let me ask you this. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? You, you have at least one. What's your spiritual gift? You say, well, what's the difference between a spiritual gift and a natural talent? Well, sometimes they coalesce, but a natural talent is something that you were born with at your physical birth. A spiritual gift that is something God gave you at your spiritual rebirth that you received through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they coalesce. God will baptize your natural talent. You have a natural talent, God can baptize that natural talent that now that becomes your spiritual gift, and you use it for the Lord. You say, well, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? Well, let me give you a few instructions. I think one, pray about it. That's a good place to start at any time, right? Just pray about it. Any situation in your life, I don't care what you're going through today, this is great advice. Pray about it. Have you prayed about it? Have you asked God to lead you and direct you and show you? I remember when I was sensing that call to preach the gospel. And, and I was just praying about it. Lord, is this you truly calling me? And I kind of tested the Lord in this. And I said, God, I'm never going to ask to go somewhere to preach. They're going to ha have to ask me. You're going to have to open the door. And I remember quoting to the Lord, Matthew 7, 7, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. I said, Lord, I'm not calling pastors. I'm not calling and, and trying to open doors myself. I want you to open the door. And all through college, I preached in churches all over the state of Kentucky when I was going to college, and every single one of them, they called me and said, I heard about you. I'd like you to come and fill the pulpit or do a youth revival or whatever it was. And that was confirmation to me that the Lord was in it because I wasn't opening the door myself. God was opening the door. And if you feel like you have a spiritual gift and no doors are opening, maybe that's not the gift that you really have because if God gives you a gift, he'll open the door. You need to pray about it. Also, I would say, listen to perceptive Christians around you. Sometimes they will see your gift before you do. You don't even know you have that spiritual gift. You don't even know it is a spiritual gift, and they see it in your life. I think about Dale Odom, the great Church of God preacher and pastor, Pastor Park Place Church of God in Anderson, Indiana, the main speaker of the Christian Brotherhood Hour, well, in 1922, he was just a young man. He was a song director. They didn't call them worship pastors back then. They just called them song directors. And he was working with Brother Chapel, Brother W.F. Chapel, who was one of the pioneer preachers of the Church of God. And, and Dale confided in him during a, during a revival. They were having a revival at the Camargo Church of God, the church where I grew up. And Dale confided in him and said, I feel like God may be calling me to preach. And Brother Chapel said, you're going to bring the message tomorrow night. Now, how would you feel about that? That's the way they rolled back then. You're going to bring the message tomorrow night. And so the next day, Dale said he got up. You can read this in his autobiography, Giants Along My Path. It's a marvelous biography. Hopefully you can find it on Amazon. I'll let you borrow it if you want to borrow it from me. Giants along my path. And Brother Chapel said, you're going to bring the message tomorrow night. So Dale said he got up and he prayed all day and he sought the Lord and he decided to preach on the narrow way. And he said, Lord, if you are the one calling me to preach, I pray one person would get saved. And he said, six people got saved that night. And gave their life to Jesus Christ. He said, I never doubted my calling again. Now, he said it was a few sermons after that before someone got saved again. He preached a number of sermons before someone got saved again. But on that first sermon, six people came to know the Lord. But it was Brother Chapel that prodded him and said, yes, you're going to bring the message tomorrow night. 
Listen to the perceptive Christians around you. Sometimes they see your spiritual gift, and sometimes it will call you to step out of your comfort zone. Dale Odom, you know, he was a marvelous musician. He was a song director. He was comfortable in that. And Brother Chapel said, step out. Preach the gospel tomorrow night. He had to step out of his comfort zone. Sometimes God will call you to step out of your comfort zone. If you say, well, I'm just going to do what I, I feel like I can do naturally, you're never going to serve God. You've got to step into the supernatural. You've got to step into how God can empower you to do something you can't naturally do, but you can do it supernaturally. That's your spiritual gift. Listen to perceptive Christians around you. And then one other thing I would say, many things I could say, but one other thing is participate in the ministries of the church. Because some of this is trial and error. Some of this you're not going to know until you participate in the ministries of the church and get involved in different areas. And, and by doing that, some of this is trial and error, you'll find out, no, that's not for me. That's just not where I feel gifted. That's not where I feel called. But other times you'll find out, yeah, that is where I feel gifted and that is where I feel called because I do believe this. I believe that if we serve in the area where we are gifted, we will be both fulfilled and effective. I believe that. If you serve where you're gifted, you'll be fulfilled. I'm not saying it's going to be a bed of roses. I'm not saying you're never going to get any pushback. I'm not saying you're always going to be on top of the mountain. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there will be fulfillment. You will believe and know you're doing the will of God and you will be effective. And let me tell you, if there are no results, nothing's happening, God's not in it. I love telling the story. I know I've told this before, but I just love the story about the, the young man who thought he was called to preach, and he couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. I mean, nobody wanted to listen to him. He was pathetic, just being honest with you. He couldn't preach. And this older minister came to him and said, Young man, are you sure you're called to preach? He said, I know I'm called to preach. He said, well, how did you discern this? He said, I was out one day in the field, and I looked up, and in the, in the clouds I saw a sign, and it said G-P-C. And he said, I knew it meant go preach Christ. And the older minister said, maybe it just said go plow corn. <laughs> maybe you misinterpreted it. Because God wasn't working through him. And if you are gifted by God, it's not you're going to have the ministry of Billy Graham. Who is going to have the ministry of Billy Graham or George Whitfield? But fruit will be born. People will come to know the Lord. People will grow in their faith if you're gifted and serving according to your giftedness. By the way, we, we have this form here at Town Church. It's called Ministry Opportunities. And I put a stack out there on the information center today. You can look at all the different opportunities we have here at Town Church where you can serve. And you can fill it out and you can tear this off and put it in the box or give it to Pastor Kyle or give it to me. We want you to be involved. You're going to be a lot more happy in the church if you're involved. If you just come, if you just come and sit on the pew and you never get involved, we still love you. We love you for coming and sitting on the pew and hearing the sermons and participating in the music, but we want you to take the next step. Get involved. Serve the Lord. He wants you to. So, different gifts in the one body. One other thing, there are different nationalities in the, in the one body, or different ethnicities. You can say it however you want to say it. Different nationalities, different ethnicities in the one body. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. We're trying to stay in Ephesians. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh. Does everybody know what a Gentile is? A Gentile was a non-Jewish person. That's what a Gentile was. And he's writing to a church that's predominantly Gentiles who have come to know the Lord. He says, so then remember at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. Jewish boys had to be circumcised physically. It says, at that time, you were without Christ, 
excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. Do you know those two go together? If you are without God, you are without hope. If you want hope, you need God. God is the God of hope. It says, but now, you read these buts in the Bible, in the New Testament, here's one of them. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away, you were a Gentile, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, notice in the rest of these verses how many times he uses the word peace. For he is our peace, who made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put to death the hostility. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, Jewish people. For through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Man, that's such a powerful passage. That is a passage about reconciliation. Reconciliation is when two people or parties who are at odds become friends again. They're reconciled. They put aside their differences or they put aside their hostility and they're one. And in this passage, you have two types of reconciliation. You have vertical reconciliation and you have horizontal reconciliation, and both are part and parcel of the gospel. You can't have one without the other. Vertical reconciliation is that we who were were at odds with God because of our sin, we are now friends of God. There is now peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ that has put aside our sin. Our sin was the barrier. Our sin was the chasm between God and sinful humanity and Christ has put away our sin so that there can be a harmonious relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's vertical reconciliation. But that's not all of the gospel. Some people stop there and they say, that's the gospel, not according to the apostle Paul. There's also a horizontal reconciliation where if you were at odds with others, and in this context, it was the Jews and the Gentiles. And the way Christ dealt with that is, he has set aside the ceremonial law. So all those laws that said, you know, you can't eat pork, and you got to worship on a certain day, and animal sacrifices, and you have to circumcise your males, Jesus put all of that aside, because that was fulfilled at the cross, so the Jews and the Gentiles could come together and worship in the name of Jesus. And it's more than just Jews and Gentiles. It's all nationalities and all ethnicities. Peace with God, but also peace with one another. You know, I'm actually glad I did not go to a Church of God school. And I'm not putting down Church of God schools. But God didn't lead me that pathway. I went to Asbury College then I went to Christian, or excuse me, Cincinnati Bible Seminary. And then I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So I went to Methodist Christian Church, and then I went to Baptist. And some people say, well, how do you do that? Well, that's, I felt like that's the way God was leading me. And when you do all that, you either come out thoroughly confused or you come out thoroughly convinced in what you believe. And I sure hope it's the latter. But what it did is it, it exposed me to other denominations and other brothers and sisters in Christ that had a heartfelt, genuine relationship with the Lord. And when I went to Asbury, let me tell you, I kind of struggled with going to Asbury because I was raised Church of God. And I thought, you know, who's going to teach me anything if they're not Church of God? And my grandmother wrote a letter to Willard Wilcox and said, my grandson is thinking about going to Asbury College. What do you think? And I don't know where that letter is. I've got it somewhere. But his first sentence said, by all means, go to Asbury. 
He went there, Char Charlie Tarr, who used to be the pastor here, he went to Asbury College. A lot of Church of God people went to Asbury College. I didn't know that at the time, but it helped me. But even with that, when I went on campus, man, I'm Church of God. And I was there to help them out a little bit, you know, my professors and everybody. And, man, it didn't take very long at all for me to be humbled by the godly men and godly women on that campus. And I sat at their feet, and I learned so much. And I saw it doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal or Methodist or Baptist or Anglican or Salvation Army. If you have a relationship with the Lord, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And there are so many cultures there. Asbury's a very missionary-oriented school. And one of the nights when I actually it was the first night where we had a gathering on the campus of the freshmen. And I met Ezekiel Koesh that night. He was there from Kenya, Africa. And it was kind of hard to understand him at first because he was still, you know, had the dialect and trying to speak English. But I was able to discern and we, we became best friends that whole year. He was only there for a year, kind of like an exchange student, but he and I were best friends. I took him all over the state of Kentucky. Everywhere I preached, I'd take him with me, and almost every weekend, he would go home with me. And I didn't know if he was going home with me because he liked me so much or because he liked my mom's cooking so much. I never could figure that out because he grew a lot that year. I mean, he grew a lot that year. He grew like 10 or 15 pounds that year. And he loved my mom's chocolate chip cookies and the ice cream. And my mom is a great cook. And, boy, he loved to come home with me. And he was in my wedding. How does a person from Kentucky have a best friend from Kenya? How in the world does that work out? It's through Jesus Christ. We didn't have anything else in common but Jesus. The way he was raised and the way I was raised, it was so different. But Jesus brought us together. Jesus. And, you know, I, th I, thank, I thank God for this church. And I wish there was more diversity, but I thank God for the diversity there is here. We have different nationalities and different ethnicities here in the church. And I want to invite the lady up right now if she would come, Miss Raina Smart. Everybody give Raina a hand as she comes up here today. <laughs> Raina and her husband Danny are part of our congregation they moved here from California, and Danny was a police officer in California, so watch your P's and Q's around him because <laughs> he knows what he's doing. But Rain is from El Salvador, and we're so happy to have her as a part of the church, and so I just want her to share a little bit today with you. Raina, how long have you and Danny been attending the church here? Hola, buenos dias. Um, we have been here since... October 22, two years already, and loving it. Amen. And tell us, when did you become a Christian? How, how old were you when you were saved and baptized? I won't say how old. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I became a Christian in 1987. Woohoo! By the grace of God, he looked upon me, and, and he had mercy on me. Amen. Um, we love your personality, Thank your exuberance, you. <laughs> your love for the Lord. We, lat we Latinos are loud. <laughs> <laughs> and you just went on the cruise, didn't you? We just went on a cruise, yeah. <laughs> Where'd you go? Uh, all the way to Honduras, um, Roatan Island. That was the country that um, Danny was missing to know all Central America. Amen. So that was fun. We ate a lot. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Bible verse? Actually, I had three. Well, let's hear them. Those are my favorite, favorite ones because I learned them when I was a little girl. My grandma helped me with those. And um, later on, they came alive. Um, I realized what these Bible verses meant for me. And um, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. The shortest one. <laughs> that was my very first one to learn. And then uh, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, me, Reina, every one of you guys, 
all over the world. You know, there is not even one person that is left um, in this Bible verse. So, for he loves me that he gave his only begotten son. That if I believe, if you guys believe in him, we will be saved. So, Amen. those three are my favorite ones. There are other ones, but um, those are those are great. Those mean a lot to me. We go over Genesis 1 1 and John 3 16 with our kids often. He created me, he created all of us. Amen. <laughs> Well, let me ask you one other question. All the different congregations here in Middletown, the surrounding area, and with your all's background, why did you choose Town Church, and why do you love Town Church and worship here? In um, uh, 22, we moved to Ohio from California, and we wanted immediately to find a church. So first Sunday, we went to, I, don't, I, I won't mention churches, but we visited three different churches and thank God for Kroger and Meyer. I, I always say Mayer, but it's Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, because driving through, I, I saw the building. I said, Danny, I think it's a, a Christian church. Let's visit it. And we start, we, we look up um, town church on the internet, and we came and visit, and we were looking for a church that is teaching from the word of God, not a wishy-washy one. <laughs> so um, here we are. Uh, hey, yeah, two, two years later. <laughs> hey, Amen. Thank you, Raina. Thank you. Anything else you want to say? Yes. Um, something else I want to add. This church had a lot of ministries, and uh, I'm blessed. I'm, it's an honor to serve God. And um, in the uh, pantry ministry, the uh, ladies' ministry, the greeters' ministry, and the prayer ministry. It has helped me a lot. I love to be involved because that keeps me accountable. And um, I'm growing. When, when you get involved in a ministry, you're, you're accountable. Now you, you start reading more the Bible, praying if you were not doing it. Now you're more because you want to be right with God. So, and, and now we're a whole family. You're my family. <laughs> you might not be Latino, but hey, I love you guys. Amen. And um, if you don't know, that's my honey, Danny. <laughs> A handsome, godly God that uh, God blessed me with, a handsome, godly man, and uh, I became a smart in 88. Amen. Because his last name is a Smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, God Raina. bless you all. Amen. Let's celebrate, Raina. Different gifts in the one body, but also different nationalities in the one body. Honey, can you hand me that? loaf of bread there. I'm going to read you a Bible verse here in just a minute that talks again about the one body, and it mentions the one loaf because we're going to take communion here in just a few moments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, it says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. I want to ask you a question today. Are you simply in a denomination or are you in the body of Christ? You say, well, this isn't even a denomination here. It doesn't matter. You can say I'm a member of town church and not truly be saved. You have to be born again. It's not enough to be in a denomination. It's not enough to attend a local congregation. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you do, you're part of the one body, the one bread. And you know, communion, I remember in college when we would meet for communion and one person would stand down and we would just pick the bread and all eat the bread. And I guess in this day and time, that's a little strange, isn't it, to have you come down. So I'm not going to do that today. By the way, if anybody wants this bread, I have my hands all over it. But if you want it, I'll give it to you afterwards. We're the one bread. We're one. We're one spiritually, whether you realize it or not. 
But, but Christ wants us to express that unity, celebrate that unity. We are the one body. We are the one loaf. We are the one bread. But sometimes we deny it by the way we act and by the way we treat other Christians and the way we, you know, cast aspersions at other denominations. And what we need to say is if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it does not matter your denominational affiliation. We are one in Jesus. There's one body, one loaf, one body. That's why as we celebrate communion today, and this is our tradition here, we celebrate open communion. You say, what do you mean by open? You got to open it up to take it? No. It's open in that it's open to everyone if you're a believer. So you say, well, I'm just here visiting or I don't even know if I'm going to make this my church home. It's okay. Do you believe in Jesus? If you believe in Jesus, you're already part of the one body. You may not have made town church your home church yet, but you're already part of the one body. We welcome you to take communion.